Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, How to Find a DPO Model that Works for Your Business. Quick, one too fast. <laughs> I'm Lisa Hofmann, the Chief of Legal Operations at Pridatech and Certified Data Protection Officer. I'm very happy to have Tresh Wittiger here with me today. Tesh is the Global Data Compliance Director at Wittiger Solutions and is an expert in information governance and data protection law and she has her DPO certification from Maastricht University. Welcome, Tesh. Thank you, Lisa. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please um, fill them in in the question part in the GoToMeeting bar or send them to us afterwards. You have the email address here on the right. And Tesh and I will try to answer all of them at the end of the webinar. So the ag agenda today is we will speak about what is a DPO and why is it important to have one? When does a company actually need a DPO? What are the responsibilities of a DPO? And of course, how you pick the right model for your company and your uh, position. So let's start with um, what is a DPO? The GDPR introduces a duty for companies to appoint a data protection officer so the so-called DPO. If the company carries out certain types of processing activities, but we will speak about them later and go there more into detail. But what is the DPO? What does he do? So a DPO assists you to monitor internal compliance. He informs and advises on the data protection carried out in your company and also data protection obligations, of course. He provides advice on data protection, impact assessments, and of course, how to handle the data protection in general in your company. And um, he acts, of course, as a contact point for data subjects. So if there are any data subject requests come in, and also as a contact point for the supervisory authorities. So a DPO is a um, company security, security leadership role. So there are different models. We will speak later about the advantages and, of course, about the disadvantages of having an internal or external DPO. Um, but a good DPO is always independent, is an expert in the field, and he always needs to have the necessary resources, of course, to carry out his job. But those are all the points we will speak later about. So, Tash, um, could you explain when does a company actually need a DPO? Absolutely. So when you need a DPO it actually differs by country. So if you look at the baseline guidelines which come through the GDPR, through the regulation, you've got a number of reasons why a DPO would be needed. So for a start, if you're a public authority, unless you're a court, you would need a DPO. Then there are the two other areas which say that the core activities of the controller or the processor consist of processing operations which require regular or systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, or they are processing data on a large scale, primarily special categories of data and criminal conviction and offence data. Now, that's what the GDPR says. As I say, each country has then got a little bit of freedom to put extra rules and regulations in place. Um, so, for example, in the UK, um, across the NHS, the National Health Service, they all need DPOs. In Germany, you have um, a stipulation on the size of the um, organisation. Is that right, Lisa? Exactly. In Germany, the controller or the processor has to appoint a DPO if they um, constantly employ at least 20 people dealing with automated processing of personal data. There again, we look for the definition of automated processing, but um, this is important interpreted very broadly by the German authorities. Exactly, and in the GDPR, they talk about what large scale is in a very limited way. What you need to look at instead is has the individual country decided what large scale looks like, because some countries have actually defined it. Um, the other place to look is the working party guidance, um, which has now been adopted since the working party has now gone, but we do have the, I'm not going to remember the name of it, but the, the um, new European authority there, where they have done a whole piece of guidance on what large scale looks like. Now, the other thing is, of course, that that's just when a company 
needs to have a DPO. That doesn't mean you can't appoint one yourself. If you believe that what your company is doing should really have a DPO in place, you can absolutely appoint one voluntarily. What you have to be careful with, though, is bearing in mind that if you do appoint a DPO yourself, they have to fulfill the requirements of the DPO. And that can be quite cumbersome on a company. So you need to consider at this point, is it a DPO you need or is it a data protection lead? And in most cases, what I tend to do is, I mean, obviously it's going to depend on the business, but generally it's just going to be data protection lead that you need. Um, unless you fall into one of these criteria, in which case you have to appoint a DPO. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's always helpful. I mean, depending, of course, on the size of the company to have a DPO, to have somebody taking care of compliance and data protection. We had this issue actually in Germany when they uh, last August, they um, hired the, the numbers of person before it was 10 people and you needed a DPO. And then it was set up to 20. And I know a lot of consultants, of course, in Germany and all the clients immediately canceled their contract. And I was like, no, you should not do this because I mean, you need to take care of data security of compliance anyway. So, I mean, it would be, of course, good to have a DPO in the company. Yeah. So, um, some people or companies are not even aware what um, data they are processing and treating. So, this is uh, the first step, of course, to notice. So, let's speak a bit about personal data in general and a special category of data, of course, Tish. Yeah, okay, so if you go back to the definition, it talks about um, large processing of special category data. Now, we need to remember that any data that is relating to a person, an identifiable person, is personal data. Okay, that is, there is then a subset of that data, which is special category data. And I think in some countries, um, this has slightly different names. Um, what do you call it in Germany, Lisa? Uh, uh, sensitive data would be the English translation, so yeah. sensitive data, exactly. So, again, we have to be careful because some countries call it sensitive, some call it special category. Within the GDPR version I have, it's called special category, and as a general rule, we consider sensitive data in the UK to be something other than special category. That might be financial data, something that is sensitive to the business but doesn't actually fall under special category data. With special category data, that is data which, if you hold that data about somebody, there is a potential that they may then, um, um, I forgot my word, sorry, they may um, find themselves at a disadvantage as a result of it. So they could be discriminated against, that's what I was after. Um, so if, if you hold this data, there's a danger that somebody could be discriminated as a result of this data being misused. So it has to have a special level of protection. So beyond, so beyond personal data, it's still personal data, but you have to be much more careful with it. So we're talking here about racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious and philosophical beliefs, union membership, genetic data, and then biometric data when it is used to identify an individual. So if you are just processing voice recordings, that doesn't necessarily mean it's special category. If you're using that voice to identify the individual, then that is considered to be biometric data used to identify an individual and become special category. And then data relating to health or sex life or sexual orientation. So if you are processing a lot of this data, you absolutely need a DPO. Thank you, Tench. I think also special category of data describes it some, somehow better because sensitive data is a very broad word and I got asked by a lot of customers and clients like, but isn't a uh, credit card number sensitive because to them it sounds sensitive. So I think yeah. uh, special category data describes it <laughs> a bit better. So now we want to talk a bit about what are the responsibilities of a DPO. And um, here we have a short overview. Of course, that's not, um, that's, uh, co completely not everything, but of course um, his responsibilities are to inform and advise the controller or processor of their obligations under the applicable data protection rules to provide advice and also monitor the process on data protection impact assessments. So it doesn't need to do it once, but it needs to be um, reviewed constantly. Then also to cooperate with and be the point of contact, as I said already before, not only for the supervisory authority, but also 
for um, the data subjects if they have any kind of requests. Um, then they need uh, to create the register of processing activities. But of course, this I always say with the help of the company, you cannot hire a DPO and expect him to do like all the register of the data processing activities. And of course, then notify EDPs and those that present specific risks, so-called to do prior checks. So um, monitor the compliance with the GDPR and other data protection laws, of course. Because as you said also before, Tesh, you have um, different legislations in the different countries. You always need to look at all of them. In Germany, it's a bit tricky because like, we have not one general authority like you have the ICO, but we have 16 different ones. So you have to look at each and see where you're processing the data. Um, yeah. And of course, yeah. I think as well, you've got to be very, very careful because the responsibilities of the DPO are set out in two areas. There are one, which is the Article 39 tasks, which are some of these, but not all. So inform and advise the control and processor of their obligations, which we've got, monitor compliance, provide advice on DPIAs, cooperate with the supervisory authority and be the point of contact for that supervisory authority. That's the only ones which they absolutely have to do. Now, there are other things they can do, but we take that from a couple of places. First of all, the Working Party 29 guidance that says that they should be the intermediary between relevant stakeholders. So that's not a article, article 39 task. It's something that the Working Party says they think they should probably do. Likewise, that Working Party also said that they feel that one of the tasks that the um, DPO could do is to create that register of processing activities, your Article 30 ROPA. Okay, now we have to be careful here because it does say in Article 39 that you don't have to limit the tasks to this, they can do more as long as there is no conflict of interest. And the Working Party have said that the only task that they see, which isn't a, a conflict of interest, is creating the ROPA. So when you have a DPO, and this is why I say about the difference between having a DPO and a data protection lead, you have to be really, really careful that you don't give them a task to do that is going to create a conflict of interest between what they have to do and what the company might want to do. So a data protection lead can have that conflict, a DPO absolutely can't, and we have to be really careful on that. Okay, great. As you said, um, those are the tasks, but of course not limited to the task. For me, the DPO should also, for example, generate raise awareness in the company for data protection issues, um, hold trainings for the staff and conducting, for example, internal audits. And it's important um, to also remember that the DPO tasks cover all personal data uh, processing activities, not just those required to appoint the DPO. Exactly. Exactly. So as your starting point, you should always make sure they're doing the, the Article 39 tasks that are listed out. You know, if you're doing a job description for a DPO, make sure you have those tasks in there. Then anything else you assign, just check that it's not going to cause a conflict. Exactly. And so? Uh, Lisa, I think you've gone on mute or I've lost my audio. Okay. Normally no, I should not. Can you go back? Okay, perfect. Then um, I just said, um, then we go from the responsibilities directly to the liabilities of the DPO. Um, yeah, and one of the most highlighted aspects of the GDPR is its potential for serious fines. So um, here you just mentioned before the working party guidance clearly states that DPOs are not personally liable in case of non-compliance with the GDPR. But this could also only um, mitigate the risk of enforcement against the DPO directly by the data protection authority and not necessarily protect the DPO from the liability uh, to the company arising from his or her negligence. So here, I think we also need to differentiate a bit the liability of an internal DPO to the liability of an external DPO. Um, I would say the internal DPO's exposure to liability depends also a lot uh, on where, or he, where he or she sits within the organization. So um, the DPO's seniority can affect the applicable uh, of the director's and officer's insurance of the company. This was my case in the former 
in my former company. So um, other key factors for the liability of internal DPOs are, of course, the existence of different insurances, indemnity agreements, um, the language of the DPO's employment contract, of course, and the jurisdiction under which the company operates. So for external DPOs, this is a bit different and more straightforward with the liability. If a company hires a DPO, uh, for it's, they basically have a service agreement. And it, the company, of course, relies also on the DPO's advice. So it could seek probably damages from the DPO in the case of a high fine, in the case that really uh, the DPO conducted negligence here. Um, yes, uh, anything from your side to that, Ted? Yeah, I think the easiest way to think of this is if you have an internal DPO, they're an employee of the business, you are not allowed to sack them because you don't agree with them. That's really important. If they're doing their tasks as set out in the article and you don't like it, tough. Um, so if they're telling you your cookie banner must change, it must change, it must change, you can't just say, I'm really sick of you telling me that, you're out. That's not going to work. They are under an obligation to tell you about it because otherwise they can face problems. They have to tell you when there's a non-compliance. But the company as a whole doesn't have to do what the DPO says. And that's really important here. You know, it's the responsibility of the DPO to raise the issue and try and convince the business to do the right thing. But the decision is with the controller or the processor as an entity, not that individual. Which means when you see some of the large companies getting breached and everyone says, oh, you know, their DPO, why didn't they make them do this? Why didn't they tell them to install that? They probably did. You know, the DPO probably said, you know, we've got a really big risk here. And the controller as a whole said, well, we've looked at the risk and that's a risk we're willing to take. And so you've got to be quite careful here that we're not blaming DPOs for everything that goes wrong. You know, as long as the DPO is doing their job as per those articles, they can't be dismissed by the company. But equally, the company doesn't have to do what the DPO tells them to. Absolutely. So, <laughs> Tesh, it would be great <laughs> if you could also explain us a little bit about your day-to-day -day tasks and um, what are you doing in your daily work and how does it look like? Yeah, I actually put this in here as a bit of a joke. Um, I <laughs> am the external DPO of eight companies, um, fairly small companies. I also then do consultancy generally. Um, so I don't have a schedule because if I even try to do a schedule, it would go haywire straight away. Because if I'm in the middle of something and one of my companies has a breach, and let's be honest, companies sh should be having breaches almost every day. They're not all going to be reportable breaches, but I need to know about them. You know, just someone sending an email in um, CC instead of BCC can end up being a breach. So if something happens in one of the companies I DPO for, I just drop what I'm doing and move to them. So actually, my entire day is spent juggling the different clients, the different issues, um, answering queries from them all. I do weekly update meetings with each of my clients. I do um, quarterly ROPA review meetings. I do quarterly metrics meetings where we monitor the number of SARS that we're having, the number of escalations we're having, things like that. So I have a lot of regular meetings, but equally the rest of my day is just whatever is coming flying at me. So I'd love if it looked like this. I'd love if I actually managed to have lunch before 3 p.m. Um, but it doesn't really happen like that. And actually a lot of my head down work, because I'm an external DPO, a lot of my head down work where I'm, you know, rewriting ropers and things like that actually happens after about seven in the evening. You know, once the kids have gone to bed and I've got a good few hours of peace and quiet, that's when policy reviews happen and that sort of work. So it is really, you know, it's lovely and flexible. I'll be honest, I love it for that. I can quite happily not start work to half past nine if I don't want to, but equally I never switch off. Um, and I said to my husband when I took on the role of DPO as a service that he had to understand if I was going to start this business, we would never have a family holiday the same way again, because I would have to make sure that I was always available for my clients. And, you know, that's how I get the work because I am instantly contactable by Slack, by email, you know, text message, whatever. And, you know, it is very backwards and forwards. So the day in the life of DPO is, I'd love it to look like this, but it so doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel you because we have the same thing here. Um, you have to be on the clock all the time. But again, 
um, yeah, it's great working with the clients, so it's yeah. totally worth it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now we want to speak a little bit more and Tesh will go more into detail afterwards about um, the possible DPO models. So there are basically three different ways of how a DPO can work in a company. So the internal full-time DPO would be a great model for very big enterprises and large companies because there an external one might uh, be missing the knowledge about the company and yeah, company specific operational um, conditions. Um, also working full time and in no other position, um, could, there could be no conflict of interest. Like uh, in the second model we want to speak about, the internal part-time DPO, there we have um, a conflict of interest. Normally he does other tasks, other things. He has another position in the company and just uh, does uh, this DPO job as a side task. I had this a lot in former companies uh, where it's just, they said like basically, so you, you do it right now, you're the DPO, and then um, because the DPO should not have any current duties or responsibilities that are in a conflict with their monitoring responsibilities, um, this is sometimes a bit tricky. For example, the legal counsel who could represent the company in a legal proceeding would be considered of having a conflict of interest and therefore not be qualified. Also functions like um, CEO, for example, are not working. So it can be very difficult finding the right person inside a company for the DPO job. And last but not least, we have the external DPO. And like the name already states, um, it is not an employee of the company. And by this, it has a very neutral position and could of course function, for example, also as an intermediary between management and employees. We had this a lot, especially in the past days with the coronavirus, with security checks, the employees were against it, and the employee, of course, wanted it. So it could be also like this intermediary function. And um, there are a lot of other advantages of an external DPO, which uh, Tish will explain in more detail in the next slides. So first, um, let's speak about the internal DPO and when it makes sense for a business, Tish. Yeah, and although I am an external DPO, I don't necessarily think that one is better than the other. It's going to depend very much on your company. Now, if you are a large company with a very complex organization where collaboration is absolutely key and there's a lot of influencing that needs to be done, you probably need an internal DPO. And that would be someone who is working full time just on data protection. Um, the slight difficulty with that is from a personal perspective i would find that very very difficult because i'm very very passionate and loyal to whatever company i'm doing and working for and to my data subjects and i think as an internal dpo it can be really hard to stay independent and not um I'm trying to think and not become an evangelist because as I said earlier, a company can say no to the DPO and say, we're not doing that. And when you're an internal DPO, that's sometimes quite hard to swallow because it can feel like you're doing a job, but you're getting kicked back all the time because the company itself doesn't necessarily think it's as important as you. Um, it can be expensive having an internal DPO, especially if you're not big enough to warrant them working all the hours you're actually paying them for, which is the case in some companies. Um, you can also, you'd have to give them 25 days holiday a year. What are you going to do when they're on holiday? Because it would be completely within their rights for you to phone them with a data breach on day two of the holiday. And they say, I'm sorry, I'm in the Caribbean. I'm on holiday. I'm contracted to have holidays. So it can be a little bit more difficult having an internal DPO. What I've seen work really well is having an internal DPO team that backs up an internal DPO. And generally, if a company is big enough and complex enough to need a full time internal DPO, they also need that team that sits behind it. So I've seen that working particularly well in um, big pharmaceuticals. You know, they will quite often have a European DPO, a US DPO, an APAT DPO, and then a group DPO as well. So it can work really, really well. Um, again, as long as they're well resourced. The last thing you want is an internal DPO whose hands are completely tied because there's no money to do anything and they can't do their job because no one's listening to them. 
Exactly. As I said, you can have a DPO team, but only one person can be the DPO of a company. We have to see that the other one are, as we said, like um, data advisors and so on, but you need one DPO inside a company. Yeah. So, and when would you say an external DPO makes sense for a business? Okay, so this can work really well if you're a slightly smaller company, you fall under the remit of needing a DPO, but you don't need them all the time. So in this case as well, it can make a lot of sense because people are slightly more likely to listen to consultants from outside. Um, certainly what I found is I have no emotional connection to the business, well, some, because I'm a bit of a wuss. I have some emotional connection, but not the same as if I work for them full time. So if they don't take my advice, I'm like, that's fine. You know, we just document it, why you haven't taken my advice, and we move on. And that makes a far better working relationship. The other thing is an external DPO will often work for multiple companies. So they tend to be the ones who are learning from each of the other companies on how something works in a particular industry, what best practice looks like, and that you get the benefit of them having worked for all these other areas as well. They're also the ones that combine with a lot of speaking opportunities because they obviously need to get the word out because they tend to work for themselves. And because they are doing a lot of speaking, they're at conferences, again, they're learning from other people. So the knowledge is a lot easier to gain when you're working independently than it is when you're working for a business and you have to go and request money to attend a conference or go through the comms team before you can speak at a conference and so on. Um, it can be a lot cheaper. Most of my clients tend to have me for a day a month. A couple have me for two days a month. Um, and a lot will charge a retainer. I actually don't charge a retainer, but a lot will re re um, do an annual retainer plus the day a month or how it works or just a pay as you go and that is a lot cheaper than taking on somebody full time that you don't necessarily need so if you've got the right business it can be perfect so it's going to depend very much on the business model as to what will work for you absolutely i totally agree with that and now just um let's talk a bit about how to make the choice i mean you explained it all uh, very well right now, but what questions does like a company need to ask themselves in order to find out what choice they do? I mean, <laughs> you covered basically everything, but yeah, for example, as you said, how high is the <clears throat> Yeah, sorry. Sorry, this is still pretty precise. I mean, the first question you have to be asking yourself is, do we actually need a DPO or not? And that is really important. I know we talked about it at the beginning of the slides, but I was approached by a company the other day who were looking for DPO as a service. And when they said the tasks they needed this person to do, they weren't DPO tasks at all. And when I spoke to them and I said, why do you want a DPO? You don't fulfill any of the criteria for needing it. They were quite taken back, you know, and it, to me, it's the absolute critical thing. If you don't need a DPO, don't be spending money on something you don't necessarily need. Be honest about what you do need and then search for the right person. So let's assume you've done that and you decide, yes, as a company, we need a DPO. You then need to look at how complex is our business, okay? Do you need to have a qualified person in-house? Can you afford to get them qualified? Because one of the criteria for a DPO is they must be qualified in data protection. They must have a certain level of knowledge. They don't have to be a lawyer, but they do have to know what they're doing. And that takes up a lot of time. I reckon I probably spend about 50% of my time learning. You know, I've done a postgrad, I've done my DPA certification, I've done all my IAP certifications, I'm just enrolling on a two year cybersecurity course. When you're a normal employee, that's quite difficult to do alongside your day job and quite expensive for a company. So, can you actually afford that? Or would you rather just port someone in who has already got all that experience and knowledge? who can jump in straight away. Um, are you likely to have tasks that will conflict with a DPO task? In which case you could probably give those tasks to someone internal and have your DPO just doing the article 39 and that's it. 39, 37, 39. <laughs> um, and then if you are gonna take on someone, in, someone internally, who's your backup? You know, if you don't have a backup and you don't have a data protection office team, you might want to go for someone external because they generally have a backup person or they're just constantly on call. Um, you also need to look at how important is it that that person completely understands your business. And when you're looking not just at 
what model you want but if you do go for external you know are you going to get someone who is happy to learn everything about your business and are you happy to have an external person on all your slack channels because certainly one of the things i do i pick up more data breaches and more training issues by just reading the slack channels than any of my regular meetings and are you happy for an external person to do that you've got to trust them and that's quite important you have to realize that the dpo isn't there to catch you out the dpo is there to help you stay within the law to help you grow your business whilst doing the right thing they're absolutely not there to catch you out and report you because that's not how it works so have you got that level of trust that you need to have someone external as a general rule if you're trying to hide things then don't employ an external person because they'll find it you know if you're doing it because you need a dpo but you don't actually want to comply with it you know that makes it very difficult for an external dpo they probably wouldn't take you on if they even got an inkling that you weren't in it for the right reason they wouldn't take you on anyway so there's some of the questions that you need to be asking i probably went on a little bit sorry um you know at, genuinely sit down and document these things which one is going to work for us and you could always start with an external one and once they've got you into a business as usual process then you might want to think about bringing in an internal person and have them working side by side yeah, so there, there are various options absolutely that's great advice from my side only a bit like if you want an internal dpo really make sure you have the resources for trainings um yes. not only of the dpo there but then from the staff um, we had a little bit problems with that with some companies in the in the past and then it's just way easier to have an external dpo who is already trained as you said before just comes in and can do the work also in way shorter time we have to see that as well you maybe hire someone internal who never did it before and then he needs to wait more time because as you said half of your day you spend learning me too so the other person as well but you can go and put on the knowledge and then it's just like done really really fast Mm. I think you know you can absolutely grow the expertise on an internal DPO. You, they will know your business inside out. Um, you know you can get them up as long as you're prepared to put the time and the money in for that level of expertise. And then the issue is also what if the person then goes away? If this person yes. leaves the company, then you have uh, another big problem. Yeah, I noticed that a lot last year. I, I tend to monitor LinkedIn to see the movement of DPOs because we went through a really interesting change where a lot of companies were advertising for DPOs and you saw people who had organically grown up through the organization jumping ship because um, the cost, the salary for a DPO was quite high beginning of last year. And we saw a lot of DPOs switching and changing and everything else. Um, if I'm looking at the trends now, what I'm actually seeing is there's less DPOs of service people now, um, but there's less DPOs as well. I think some companies are realizing they didn't need a DPO, they needed a data protection lead, certainly in the UK, obviously not in Europe, and they needed a data protection lead. And so they are taking people in who can do the data protection role and stuff that may or may not conflict. Um, so it's a real change and it does seem to be sort of up and down. I think we're still settling down to try and work out what is the best for every company. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So um, now, of course, uh, let me introduce a bit Prida Tech and what we do, because this is really great product as we are a platform for internal DPOs, helping them, supporting them. But also we take, of course, um, the task of an external DPO. And as we spoke about it before, I think the most important thing with, in data protection is also just to detect, detect in, and identify risks at the beginning. So this is not the most important thing, but the first task you do. If you go on a company, you have like a gap analysis of, to detect everything what maybe can lead to a risk. Then you define and suggest measures, of course, what you can do in order to mitigate those risks. And in the last step, of course, you need to monitor this, monitor the implementation of this. And this is a constant job. Also, a lot of people think that um, data protection is one time job. They do it and then, then it's done. But of course, it's not like the, this. You need to constantly monitor it. 
So we have, of course, this trusted technology so solution for data protection, which can do a lot of things what we already spoke about, like the risk assessment and impact assessment. Um, we have like the processing activities and all the technical organizational measures in order to help the company to build a safe ground for data protection. And of course, you can try it. You can try it um, online. You can try it. Contact us for a free demo so you can have a, a seven day free trial. And we are happy to do so. And now we have a little look at the questions we received. Let me just check it. And one question is yeah, exactly. What does a company need to do in order to support the DPO? Um, yes. First, of course, as we already stated, to provide the financial measures and, of course, also in personal. If you need personal, then the company has to put this and the company needs to give the DPO, for, um, especially if it's external, appropriate access to all the personal data and the processing activities, as you said <laughs> before, that you like to go through Slack in order to find data breaches. Um, this would be a point. Then, of course, making sure that the DPO can operate independently and is, of course, as we said before also, he cannot be dismissed or penalized for, for performing their tasks. Um, anything you would like to add, Stash? Yeah, they need a voice. So your, um, your DPO should have a direct voice to the board. And if you've employed a DPO just because you know you need one, but you're not actually listening to them, that's not supporting your DPO. So if you know when you take them on, you've got to make sure that they have people in place to be able to help them with work. They might need money to buy a solution so they can record their um, ROPA and their risk, risk assessments, their DPIAs. They need access to the right teams. If you're going to be doing data protection by um, default and design, they have to be in on the design meetings. So you've got to give them your full support and if you think of the culture of compliance always comes down from the top and this is a perfect example they have to have the endorsement of senior leadership that this is something the company truly believes in and this person here is the pinnacle person who is going to make it happen for us you know you've got to trust them and you've got to let them do their job absolutely so the next question I like a lot because it's, uh, I have experienced it by myself and it is, can we share a DPO with other organizations? So I was a DPO myself for a group of companies, all located even in different countries. So it was in France, Germany, Switzerland and Spain. Switzerland, we didn't need one because there is no GDPR, but <laughs> we appointed one anyway. Um, it is very difficult from my experience. Um, even though the companies were still all still very, very small. But um, as we mentioned before, there are different legislations, uh, even to register the DPO, there are different processes in order to register yourself for this company. So um, yes, you can appoint a single DPO to act for a group of companies, but I see it rather difficult. What is your opinion on this? I think, again, it depends on your model. Um, you can absolutely have one DPO for two group companies. There is no reason at all why you can't have someone who works part time for you and part time for the company up the road. You know, that's no problem at all, as long as, you know, all the right measures in place. And likewise, an external DPO like me, I work for eight different companies as DPO. So it's absolutely possible. No, absolutely. I mean, for different companies, of course, but I think here was, was like mother daughter companies. Yeah. And um, if they are located in different countries, I mean, I did it, it's, it's okay, but it's a yeah. struggle. <laughs> well, one of the stipulations of the DPO, um, I can't remember where it's written, so don't quote me on it, but I know it's in there somewhere, is that they have to be able to respond, it might be the German regulations, they have to be able to respond to the data subject either in their own language, um, no, they have to be native speaking, or be able to respond almost instantaneously if they're not a native speaker. And that can cause problems. I can't remember when Absolutely. I came across it for Germany when I was um, working on something. And, you know, which means that because one of the companies I work for has a company in the UK and one in Germany. So when I get anything in from a German data subject, I have to have someone on hand to do the translations for me straight away, backwards and forwards. 
Yeah, for me, the problem was also a bit France here. Yes, because as a DPO, you need to be easily accessible, what we okay. say. And yeah, that sometimes can be tricky. But again, for the question, yes, you can appoint the DPO for several organizations. Okay. So I see a okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Uh, in order to be a DPO, say of a bank or farmer company, is it in your experience important to have prior sectoral experience? Yes, <laughs> I would honestly say yes. Um, you know, I've done a lot of um, work with one of the big pharmaceuticals. Um, and I had such a learning curve. I wasn't DPA for them, but I was setting up a privacy program alongside their DPO. And there is so much that is very particular to them. Likewise, um, if you're working in the NHS, for example, in the UK, it's a completely different world from the health, health tech sector. I do a lot of my work in the health tech sector. So things like health apps and things like that. You know, it's it's totally different, and there are things that are embedded in the culture of some sectors that you're just never ever going to change, and you have to work around them. But you need to know what they are in order to put the right program in place. Um, you know, as DP as a service, I do have a mix of sectors I work in, but somehow have gravitated more towards health tech than any other, and understanding the nuances of that. So yes. Prior experience does help, not necessarily, but does help. I totally agree, especially with the sector. Uh, when I came to Prida Tech, they were already focused as well on the health sector. And I had a lot of experience as a DPO, so I was like, oh, easy daily business. But no, I had, again, also, as you said, such a learning curve, so much important things I did not know before, especially again in Germany with the 16 different states that you have not to only look at their um, data protection legislation, but then again uh, on the hospital data protection <laughs> legislation of yeah. each 16 states. And that's just, yeah, yeah. experience in the sector helps a lot. It's not just the data protection legislation you have to know about, it's everything else that surrounds it. So in the UK, you know, for some, some entities, it's going to be the Freedom of Information Act. Um, if you're looking at schools, it's going to be some of the safeguarding things. So there are other legislations that you have to become an expert in as well. You can't ever just look at things purely from a data protection perspective. You've got to look at all the legislation that surrounds it. Absolutely. So last but not least, how can I register a DPO? I think for the UK, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, if you're talking about the UK, um, there's a link on the website um, of the ICO. It used to be something you filled in online. Now I think they just give you an email address and tell you to write new DPO or something like that in the subject line. Um, there is some discussion because they, they do keep a register of DPOs, which is public. They used to have a tick box on there where you could tick to say, don't make these pub these, this data public. Um, but for some reason, they seem to reverse that slightly now and they are releasing all the data, which I've got to admit, I'm not that happy with. I started getting spammed by companies who are trying to contact all DPOs in the UK and they got it off the, D off the ICO list. So if you, if you can, I would put a line in there saying, do not make these details public. Because although you have to put the DPO's contact details on your privacy notice, it doesn't have to be more than dpo at abc.com. You know, I personally don't like having my name and phone number out there on public registers of DPO because there are some data subjects who I'm afraid are obnoxious, you know, and they will threaten to sue you here, there and everywhere on email, you know, and when there's computer screen between the two of you, like, yeah, this is okay, I can handle this. But once you know that your details are out there and you are a person with a phone number and an address, it's not as nice. So, you know, I would always recommend that when you do register a DPO, register their address as your company address, their email as DPO at or privacy at or whatever, and ask to put the name hidden. And they may or may not do that, depending on who happens to be dealing with it that day. Absolutely. Again, yeah, the law states you have to provide uh, the contact details of the DPO, but as you just said, email address completely enough. I do exactly the same here. So, um, yeah, that would be it from all the questions we've got. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your insights with us, Tash. And everyone, thank you so much for watching and see you again the next time. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye.